There is going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you over there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, will be glorious, I do declare. And God as the Son will be the leading one at that meeting in the air. Listen to music. May be seated. <clears throat> Feel my way with love this evening. Amen. Let me walk, blessed Lord. Number 28 in the spiral book. Let me walk, blessed Lord, in the way thou hast gone. Leading straight to the land above, giving cheer everywhere to the sad and the lone. Fill my way every day with love. Fill my way every day. As I walk with the heavenly dove, let me go all the while with a song and a smile. Fill my way every day with love. Keep me close to the side of my Savior. Never let me 
from wrath and my soul satisfied. Fill my way every day with love. Fill my way every day with love. As I walk with the heavenly dove, let me go. Let's all Sam will sing this next one, change over the service. <clears throat> Just a little talk with Jesus. Now let us tell him all about our sorrows. Amen. <clears throat> I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. And then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He had bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Let's talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. And you'll feel a little prayer wheel turning. No little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my path seems drear without a ray of cheer. And then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide the starry skies. But just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and answer by and by. And when you feel a little prayer will turn and know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. I might have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches night and day. I go to him in prayer, he knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. And when you feel a little prayer will turn in, know a little fire is burning. Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Amen. <clears throat> let's go ahead and let's get cha service changed over this evening. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. 
power and love as we sing holy 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 high and lifted up shining in the light of his glory pour out your power and love as we sing the Lord. Good to be back in Georgia. Been traveling for about a week. Looks, sounds like, looks like. Lost an hour in the process. Man, I still haven't found that hour of sleep back yet. I don't know about y'all, but uh, kind of rough. But I hope they pass legislation that they're supposed to pass that we don't have to change that clock anymore. That would be in the state of Georgia, though. If you go somewhere else, you may have to. So, but uh, good to be here tonight. Good to have you here with us. Uh, Brother Anderson has to work. He's doing some work, so that's why he's not here. Brother Bob also is having a problem at work, so he's there trying to take care of that. And I don't see Luis and Christine. I think Luis was out a day or so sick uh, from work, Brother Joe said. So let's just remember them in prayer. Also remember, let's pray that this bad weather just gets on out of here because it's... It was showing back there a few minutes ago that uh, some tornadoes have really tore up Mississippi and coming through Alabama so and heading our way. So we know uh, we know the maker. We know the master of the wind. So we need to uh, pray before we go to bed. This thing will get out of the way. Also, by way of announcement, Brother Trevor Emons will be here with us Sunday to preach both services. Uh, be good to see him again. I hadn't seen him for a little while. He came by here a few years ago. Um, but just remember him. Also, Brother Russ Dunker will be here the middle of the week next week and uh, to fellowship with us, the brother from Minnesota. And then I'll be speaking next Wednesday also. All right, so still remember June the 17th, the Father's Day annual fishing trip. Also remember... That coming up on this Easter's coming up in a few weeks, and uh, June and I will be in Arizona for about a week to speak for Brother Chris Long. So just remember that in your prayers. We had a good time in Kentucky. Everybody said to you hello, and uh, we had a real good time. Stayed an extra day and had some real good fellowship. So uh, thank you for all your prayers. We didn't have any trouble getting up there and didn't have any trouble getting back. So really enjoyed that. So let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 9. <clears throat> And continue on eternal redemption, part 10. We were, when we were in Kentucky, uh, I spoke on uh, this same subject, but kind of got into um, predestination and foreknowledge, and, and there was really some good things brought out. Uh, you know, when you... When you go somewhere as a preacher and they tell you, you know, good job, and then they all just disperse and go in their white merry way, you know, it's, well, we had a good time and see you later. But uh, we had time to fellowship, and, and one brother said, I've never heard that preached as plain as you preached it. It was predestination. He said, they, he said people have made it so mysterious and so strange. Well, Pop knows that. You know, they make it so mysterious, so strange that you can't understand it, but if you'll just take it simply by the way we that we're preaching it here, and Brother Dale's preaching it's just so simple, that by foreknowledge he knew everything. Right. <laughs> That's pretty much it. By foreknowledge he knew everything. So then he could predetermine what's going on by your desire. Right. He desired that all of us be saved. He desired all of us be up to the statue of perfect man. He desired everybody to be a Christian. Right. But not everybody's going to because we're a free moral agent. There's Luis and Christine, so he's better. There they are right there. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them in. So Hebrews 9, verse 11, and let's pray before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you give us, this hour that we're living in, that we can understand you, 
that we can, Lord, you said, by understand the mystery of this end time, Lord, that all that will be made known to your people. Father, we thank you for the word that we hear here, Father, and we thank you for you, all the ministry here, Lord, that speaks in this pulpit and around the world, Lord, the true ministry, the true bride of Jesus Christ. We thank you for each one. Lord, we pray that you'd heal the sick, Lord, the ones among us that are not feeling well. Some have work to do, Father. We know that that gets in the way sometimes. But, Lord, we know that you're the only one that can satisfy. Man has tried to satisfy this world from trying to make money and buy this and buy that, but there's only one satisfaction, and that's in Jesus Christ. And that's you, Lord, the Word. So forgive us of our sins. Bless this day. Keep us and lead us and guide us. By your Holy Spirit, be with us, Lord, tonight with this storm coming in, bad weather. Man says it's coming. But, Lord, we can say no, that that thing can turn and go another direction and not come by here, Lord, and cause any damage. We pray for the ones that's already had damage there in Mississippi and, and Alabama, Lord. We pray that you'd touch each one. They're, we're human beings, Lord, and we're at the mercy of this thing for a time being. But, Lord, you told us when we come up that statue of a perfect man that we would come into speaking condition and we could, Lord, do the things we need to do, Lord, to get through and get by. Father, just be with us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us revelation. You do the speaking tonight, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And also remember Brother Aaron, too. He, he's not sick, sick, but he's, he, hadn't, he had a test and hadn't got it back yet, so that's why he's not here tonight. He's just kind of self-quarantining for a few days. And, uh, and if he'd have got his test results back and it had been negatory, he'd be up here tonight. All right, so Hebrews 9, 11, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. I hope that sinks in. Having obtained right. eternal redemption for us. You may be seated in the Lord at his blessing to the reading of the word, and we're going to read this quote again. I know sometimes, you know, I was telling you, Brother Claude and I were talking, it, it takes it takes 12 to 15 times for humans to read something to get comprehended. So this is the plan part 10. So we're getting close to number 12. Okay. But redemption is one of the oldest things in the Bible. Actually, I don't want to add to what Brother Brown said. It's the only thing that's in the Bible. If redemption is coming from as far, when we go to uh, there, there had to be a covering before Adam even came on, came on the earth because what? God by foreknowledge knew Adam would fall. God by foreknowledge knew Eve would fall. God by foreknowledge knew they would need a sacrifice before they even hit the earth. <clears throat> so he had it there waiting on them. And to me, that's grace. Grace, amazing grace that covered them for the sin that they did because it turned the whole world upside down and put us in chaos. But yet God was right there, and we'll see Adam and Eve one day. And you know what? I'm not going to go up to Adam and Eve and say, why'd you do what you did? No. We're just going to rejoice and be happy that we made it. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so it's one of the oldest things in the Bible. Did you know redemption was even? The plan of redemption was laid out before the world was ever formed. You know, we've been talking about this. Just think of this. God foreseeing and making a way of redemption before he even made the world. Now, what happens is, is I was thinking yesterday... We say God had a plan and God had a purpose. That's good. But who is it for and who is he going to use to get this plan going and get this plan in motion? He's going to use human beings. He's going to allow or let man fall so that his attributes can be made manifest. That was his plan. Because foreseeing, he could see and then his dad and I were kind of briefly last night talking that there is a predetermined destiny for certain things. Right. And he's been covering that. He covered it Sunday. Right. There's, a, there's going to have to be a five-fold ministry. Yeah. It doesn't name every prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Uh -uh, but it says you must have apostles, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist to perfect the saints. So that is a predetermined, preset there had to be seven church age messengers. There had to be an, a day of Pentecost. There had to be Jesus physically dying on. Those things had to happen. That was predetermined and cannot change. 
What you and I have to do is, is you and I have to connect ourselves to that. See, that's our choice. Here it is. Moses told the children of Israel, he said, this day, choose you this day who you will serve. And they had to make a choice because they had this list of things that if they did, this is what God was going to bless them. And then there was a list in Deuteronomy of the things that if they didn't do it, they were going to get this curse. Amen? So it was laid out pretty well for them because you and I, though we see by the baptism of the Holy Ghost that we don't do away with the Ten Commandments, we don't do away with all the things that happen in the Old Testament, but they have to be used as types because, listen, we're, we're surely not going, God's not going to make us go out and marry a prostitute. But he used that as an example in the Old Testament under the blood of bulls and goats. Now, I want you to remember something because this plan of redemption actually contains the blood of bulls and goats. Because without that gap in between there, they would have just been lost. There would have been nobody saved. It's what we were talking about this weekend. And, and like what Brother Richard Hyatt, he was, we were talking about uh, nobody being saved or having the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the new birth in the Old Testament. He agreed and he liked the way that we brought it out because they had the Holy Ghost. Now listen, you can't reject that John... The Bible says John had the Holy Ghost, but it never said John had the new birth. You said that's the same. No, they're not. You can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost every day of your life on your spirit and die and go to hell, but you can never have the new birth and die and go to hell. If you have the new birth, you don't. You got free ticket to glory, but you can have the Holy Ghost. You can have people. Ananias was anointed by the Holy Ghost. Balaam was anointed by the Holy Ghost. Amen? There was a donkey anointed by the Holy Ghost one time. Amen? But now in the end, well, that's not going to happen now because God has honed it down to me and you. Jesus came to not save the donkey. He came to save the human. And then he would take his Holy Ghost and put it into that human. And I was reading back here a few minutes ago, Brother Branham was talking about you know, he says, I don't believe in transmigration or, or all these different things of, of the soul. And then he talks about soul sleeping, and we may get to that. If we don't, we'll get to it next Wednesday. Where you're a smith, believe that, you know, when you died, you stayed there in the ground. You, that's where you lay. That's what, they call it soul sleeping. When you die, that's where you lay. You're there. Your soul, your consciousness, and everything is in, that, is in the grave. No, no, that's not true. We know that. That's why I'm covering these dimensions because God had to set these dimensions up before the foundation of the world. Now, they were empty, some of them. But they were empty at a time, but as soon as Abel died and as soon as Cain died and as soon as all these people started dying, God had to have a place to set each and every one of them because he, didn't, he has never, ever Ever since he created a soul, he has never to this day destroyed one. Never to this day. You heard what I said. Never to this day has he destroyed a soul. He has put that soul somewhere. So that's how much he thinks of that soul, like we were talking about in Saul where Brother Brown said, now hell's not burning because they've not been judged yet. You say, well, now look, with me and you, when me and you look at that, we say, yeah, I think they've already been judged. But you and I, we were talking about this weekend, you never know when somebody's right on their deathbed and they say, God, forgive me. Yeah, right. You're not, if you're not there, you don't know. So I like what Brother Richard High said. He said, let God judge them. Right. You quit judging them. He said, just forget it. What are you going to do? Right. You can't bring them back. We, we'll read here in a minute where, where even the rich young ruler asked Abraham, he said, can I get back and tell my brothers to not come to this place? And basically Abraham said, even though they get ra you ra we could raise you, God could raise you from the dead, they're not going to believe it anyway because right. they didn't believe it to start with. God's already sent them a provision. Right. He already sent them the bosom of Abraham. He already sent them prophets. Right. And look at what the rich young ruler, he turned Jesus Christ down himself. Okay and he was sent to hell. Yeah. 
where he's still waiting right now. And that's the whole thing. Wherever they are, they've been there for a while. They can't pass through something. They can't migrate over here. They can't get better once they leave. No, this is your time. I was thinking the other day, and whether we get to this or not, I'm, I'm going to bring this point out. But look, at God is standing back and looking, and we see people that, are, that doesn't make it to the age of accountability. God knew that. He knew the heart of that person. So he could put, and thank God he sent us a prophet to say all babies go to heaven. Because they can't be judged because there's nothing to judge them for. Because Jesus Christ is the one that is the righteous judge. And all he's going to do, he's going to say, hey, they didn't make it to the, the, to the age of accountability. They didn't know any better. How many, how many billions of babies have been born in this world that's going to heaven because they, they died before? I was just reading in Joshua this morning in my scripture reading where Joshua went into one of those uh, cities and, and killed everything that had breath, it said. So it had to be women, children, men, and God told him to do that. Okay, see, that's hard for us to, to realize that God told him to do that. But that was under the blood of bulls and goats, and that was the thing that he told Joshua what to do. His commission was, was to drive all the people out. Well, he, he didn't want some of them driven out. He wants some of them done away with. Yeah, right. Amen? But you see, all baby, how many countless babies has been since then, though, that have, that have died that are going to be there somewhere now? Right. Look at what happened to Sharon Rose. And that's one thing you look at when, when the Brother Branham walks by in that vision and he sees that grown woman. So you see, Sharon Rose died as what? Six-month-old baby. Yeah. But when she went across the curtain of time, she wasn't a six-month-old baby. She was an 18-year-old girl. See, that was already fixed in God's mind. He predetermined that, but he saw that she would pass away. He saw that the prophet would do what he did. He saw that Sharon Rose would pass away, and he had a provision waiting for her. See, sometimes we so narrowly think that, well, we're the only people in the world. I was thinking yesterday when I was reading, or this morning when I was reading the book of Joshua, it's told of all those different cities that had hundreds of thousands of people. Sometimes we just hone in and say, well, it wasn't nothing but the Jews in the Old Testament, the children of Israel. No, this world was being populated and they were moving and they were, they were building kingdoms and they were setting up things. But Israel was his chosen. Right, right, amen. And he told Israel, he said, wherever you put the soul, Joshua, wherever you go, I'm going to bless you. Right. And then you place the people in that promised land. But he had, there had to be a slaughter there has to be a slaughter for us to go up to the statue of a perfect man. There has to be. It's in a bloody affair. I told the church there the other night, I said, look, it's real strange that the prince of peace stood one day and said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. I came to bring a division. The prince of peace said that. It's hard for us to believe, but once you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you'll believe it. And you'll know that that's what's happening is that you and I, what? We're fighting our way to heaven. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> it's not a picnic. It's a battle. Amen. Titus 1 verse 1. That he promised this eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Paul's very clear here, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. As I said before, you might get born again by press and play, but you will not become a full-grown Christian by just listening to tapes because that's what the Bible tells us, that the perfecting of the saints is under a five-fold predestinated ministry that has to happen. It's got to happen. You know why it's got to happen? You see there? You see why that has to happen? Because he knew you needed it. He knew I had to sit under a ministry. I was thinking yesterday, and I, I just want to make this statement. You know, I get in trouble making statements anyway, so I'm going to make it. I see all the people. We were talking this weekend about all the people who fell away from the message. And I just want to make this statement. You know, you, you look at some of the people, and I don't want to call names because everybody knows who's left the message. We ain't got to, we ain't got to post it. But look what they had great anointings. They could preach like a house on fire on a windy day. They could run the aisles. They had people running the aisles. They had congregations running the aisles. They had them shouting and screaming and speaking in tongues. 
and they're living in adultery. Denying the message. So what's that got us? It takes a five-fold ministry. People can't sit and listen to a pastor. They want to go to this one and go to that one. They want to church hop and go to this one and go to this one. Nobody ever wants to hear a teacher because they're boring. But I thought, you know, when Jesus, during his whole life, during his whole life, I don't think he ever raised his voice much, except when he was at the tomb of Lazarus. He cried with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. But every time he dealt with a demon, he was as calm as a cucumber. You know why? Because he had control. He knew he had virtue or strength. And Brother Brown, the same way. How many times have you ever heard him raise his voice in a prayer line? I've never heard him raise his voice in a prayer line. He talks. So that's what the problem is. Have we shouted this thing? Out, you know, we just shouted all, all we're doing is just shouting and screaming and speaking in tongues. And, and hey, that's okay. That's good. But when you come down here and you go out Monday, what have you heard on Sunday? That you felt good and it was all good and this was great. And, I had, cause I, and you know what? Sunday afternoon after we finished the service, we sang for what, Jim, another 20 minutes after I preached or even 30 minutes because the Spirit of the Lord was in the building. Nobody was shouting, but you could just see people weeping. And they were just so calmly just praising the Lord, and we just never couldn't stop the service. And afterwards, and, and you know me, I wasn't running the aisles. I mean, I slammed my fist down every once in a while just to get them awake like y'all are asleep now. But... Um, I'll go get some toothpicks or something, put them in your ear or stick a toothpick somewhere else. Stay awake. But uh, I told them, I said, you know, that's, that's the way it ought to be. I said, oh, it ought to be. You ought to bring the word of God, and then if that spirit falls, speaking in tongues, shouting, that's okay. But what about just a calm spirit that comes over the building? And people just kind of, you know, and they just praise the Lord for about 30 minutes. Couldn't stop the service. Brother Richard just kept saying, he said, I, this is feeling good up here. So we, you understand what I mean? I, and I'm not saying anything against that. We've got to have it. But there's five parts to it. Right. Everybody loves an evangelist, and that's okay because an evangelist is all up, you know, and that's okay. But you know what? He's got to leave, but the pastor and the teacher and the different ones and the prophets and apostles, they have to live with the people. Right. They have to live with the problems and the issues and all the things that go on. And what are we doing with it? Are we, as Brother Brown said one time, tooting it out the whistle? Yeah. We've been around 60 years, and what has that got us? Because yeah. I believe the word, when we come to the end time, standing on the word 100% is going to get you further than your shouting and speaking in tongues and all those different things. Because the devil can impersonate everything but the revealing of the word. He cannot replace... Oh, yeah, he can try, but he can never. That's why I, that Brother Dale, this, we were coming down the road, coming down the road Monday, and June and I were, you know how you get aggravated when something starts buffering? Right? You're getting this. We were in the car coming down the road, and we weren't getting good cell service, and Dad would speak about four sentences, and then it would start buffering. Well, June and I looked at each other, and I said, does that bother you? She said, no, not really. I said, me either. I said, it gives me time to think in between. The four sentences he said, and then there's about a minute in there that it's buffering, and I'm trying to, I'm thinking what he said, so I think that works out pretty good. So from now on, what we're going to do is we're going to speak four sentences. No, I'm just kidding. We'll be here six hours, but I'll guarantee you'll get more than you get now. But that's just the way we are as humans, though, because you only process so much. We know that. And we can only endure so much, and I know that. But it's the word, bottom line. It's the revealing of the word that's predestinated. Somebody will come to it because there will be a perfecting of the saints. And somebody, see, then what you got to do, though, is you got to connect yourself to that. This is the eternal part. This is the predestinated part. But you got to connect yourself to it because you got to make a choice. Amen? <clears throat> so now let's read Ephesians 1 and let's start with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. How many times has Brother Dale and I have been telling you we don't want to be chosen by him because 
Everybody was chosen by God. He knew every person that'd be on this earth. <clears throat> he knew what Adolf Hitler would do when he got here and all the different ones. So they were, they were chosen. They were. Many are called, but few are chosen. We understand that. But that before the foundation of the world, look, though, but look at this one group of people that we should be holy and without blame. So that does away with a lot of people. That does away with a lot of spirits and a lot of denominational ideas, and that does away with a lot of our ideas. But see, it says that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. If you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost today, you are blameless. And you are the holy, righteous bride of Jesus Christ. Now, that's what he sees. Now, the devil don't see that. But look, having predestinated us into adoption. So, see, there's another thing. <clears throat> adoption is not a maybe. We might. There might be a group get to it. No. That's what struck me coming down the road. Having predestined. Now, see, that is a predetermined destiny. Right. Now, we know it's all by foreknowledge, but still there's things that are set in stone. There's going to be an adopted group of people because Peter said, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temper, temper, patience, patience, godliness, godliness, brother, kindness, and love. And then it took a prophet of God to put all this together to tell us that you and I needed to go up a statue of a perfect man, that you and I needed to go up this stature of a perfect man in the end time. So there is a predestinated. When Brother Branham was sitting in the woods and he started drawing, remember he come, the, the Lord came to him and he did, made all the drawings and preached the stature of a perfect man. He said he'd never seen it like that before and and what a revelation. Well, that was a predestinated time that God knew that that prophet would be there. He knew he would have a mouthpiece, so he brought the word to the mouthpiece. Now, listen, he didn't bring that. <clears throat> he didn't bring that to Brother Ram in 1957. He didn't bring that to Brother Ram in 1947. He didn't bring that to him in about 1959. He brought it to him when Brother Branham could preach it to us that he had went up that statue of a perfect man and God had given those gifts to him to bring it to me and you. And to bring it to me and you, was that was his job. His jo Listen, his job was not for him to just go up that statue of a perfect man. His job was not just for God to perfect him. His job was not that God was going to bring him back to perfect us. He's not going to bring Brother Brown back to perfect us. He gave us a predestinated plan that did not include a prophet coming back into this dimension. Show me one. Show me one. You say, oh, no, 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 Samuel. No, wait a minute. That's Old Testament. You can't bring up souls from the sixth dimension now. You can't do that. They're there. Listen, they don't want to come back here yet. They don't. Death is still reigning here. Death doesn't reign over there. Brother Brown said, have I got to go back? Right. That was his whole thing. Right. That thing's laying down there. I know it. He, you know what? He had his faculty. He knew if he got back in that body, he was going to die. Right. So he said, can I stay here? No, you got to go back. It's not your time yet. Right. Having predestinated us into adoption. So everybody that's born again... According to Romans 8, we all receive the spirit of adoption when we get born again where we cry, Abba, Father, or Daddy, Daddy. What? You cry because you're a baby. But now as we grow up in the statue of a perfect man, we should not be crying anymore. We should not be having to told to go to church or told to get here on time or told to you know, do the things we're supposed to do. It should be automatic. <clears throat> There's a lot of things that the world does that they do it so many times that it's just repetition until it just becomes second nature. So what's our problem? What's our problem as Christians? I mean, I know when I get up tomorrow morning, I know that I got 380 mailboxes. They don't move. People do sometimes. But I know almost, Brother Donnie, I can close my eyes and almost now I can throw them in the slot that need to go in. Well, now, if you can do that because of repetition, then why can't you do the same thing with repetition of the gospel? 
Why can't you do where you can, where you can open and uh, you don't have to be able to quote every scripture, but you know what? <clears throat> if you start talking about the Lord and the scripture pops in your mind, it's in that Bible somewhere. It didn't just come from over here in uh, Greer's Almanac. It came from the Bible. But you know what? If you never read the Bible, prime example, Jim's dad, good man, good man walking shoe leather, wonderful man, but he's never read the Bible. He said, oh, he might have read it a long time ago. So how can I talk to him? I was talking to him about the Bible. He didn't know anything about the Bible. He just knows that there was a Jesus and there, that he came and died and and all the different things, and the Moses, and all the little stories that was told. Why? It's not repetition because he's not opened the book. Right. He's not read the prescribed reading. Right. Because listen, this was predestinated before the foundation of the world. Right. Written because of foreknowledge, though, but he wrote this, and guess what? When he sent it down to us, it's so sure it never changes will never change. Well, as it's what we talk about, Brother Richard and I. We, this, thing's, this thing's just going to, this is just, this is so limited. But when we get to glory, this is not going to, this is going to go away. You're not going to see Bibles. Right. Oh, yeah, you might see them as a testimony or as a memorial. But what are you going to see? You're going to see us. Right. Living epistles. That's what God, listen, from the beginning, if there had not been a fall, there wouldn't have been a Bible. But there was, and we need one. There was a fall, and we need a Bible. We need a guideline. We need a guidepost. We need these things to tell us what to do and us not do them begrudgingly, but do them for the glory of the Lord. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children, verse 5. We're not going to get anywhere tonight, but that's okay. We'll <clears throat> get as far as we can and stop. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, Amen. in whom we have what? Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now watch. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. There's the key. Now this plan is not so mysterious that we can't understand it. If it was, he's not a righteous judge and he's not a good daddy. Why would I want to give Josh this mysterious book to get to this place and, and say, man, you just got to figure it out. No, give him the... Give him the book. That's what we were given. Now, what, what man has done to it has made it mysterious. But having made known unto us the mystery of his will. So there's a, that's where that fivefold ministry, that's where that predestinated, it's going to come. You got to decide whether you want to hear it or not. You got to decide where you want to sit here. You got to decide where you want to uh, listen to this or listen to that. That's your choice. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, not our will, his will, according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. Look, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which is now, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Look, being predestinated according to what? Being predestinated according to the purpose, the plan and purpose was to have children that were going to have a no spot, no wrinkle. They were going to be his children and his wife, not so much the church. Because it took a prophet to tell us one day that this is talking about the church and this is what they get and this is talking about the bride and this is what she gets. Now, sometimes it overlaps. But when you come down to wife and church, two different things. Way two different things. Because remember, the church has prostituted herself out. The bride of Jesus Christ is virgin, stays virgin, will be virgin all the way through. Amen. <clears throat> That's why Brother Brown, God won't touch. Brother Brown said, I know why I hate that organization. I hate that denomination. Why? It's a prostitute spirit. It's a spirit of prostitution.
in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Romans 8, verse 28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called, the called, right. not a called, the called right. according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate right. to be conformed. What? He predestinated somebody to be conformed to the image of his son. Amen. There he did predetermine there was going to be, he was going to die for the world and then someone is going to have to accept that because there's no other way. And that's the predestinated part. And he also did predestinate, he also did predestinate what? To be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate or predetermine then he also called, whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, then he also glorified. Then the rest of the scripture says, so what can we say? If God be for us, who can be, who can be against us? Amen. So look, and the Brother Brown says the word predestinate. That's not a good word to use. I know we're hammering this, but if you'll ever get foreknowledge and predestination, you'll understand, as we were talking about Sunday, you'll understand where Brother Brown says you always were eternal because there was, I, I had pulled some quotes well, Brother Brown, so you always were weak. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I'm fixing to read you one right there. Number three says, how can I take a cuckaburra and make a grain of wheat out of it? That was my question to those in, in Kentucky. But you can give me any quote, and almost by, by knowledge, I can find you one real quick that sounds contrary. Yeah. Brother Brown comes up one day and says, let's stand up and address the third person of the Trinity. Well, he wasn't addressing his third person. He was addressing their third person because he only had one person. But he was talking to a group of people, mixed multitude, so he had to say those things sometimes. And then he would come in and he would look like Paul right there in Ephesus. Now, the Ephesians could swallow what I was just reading to you to a degree. But he didn't say that to the Corinthians because they were messed up. But the Ephesians had done what? They had grown in grace and knowledge. They had grown under Paul. So Paul could tell them, according to you have chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, having predestinated us into adoption of children. They understood what he said. When we see that in, in some of the terms of what comes in the message, is it, it's just predetermined. It doesn't matter what I do. I always was weak. Well, Read the next one. Think number three, please. How can I take a cuckaburra and make a grain of wheat out of it? It's impossible for me to do it. See, he's explaining. Now, Brother Brown's explaining. It's impossible for him to do that. It's impossible for me to go out. I planted my taters the other day. That's T-A-T-E-R-S for those of you who don't understand. <clears throat> to others, that's potatoes. But I went out and planted my taters the other day. Now, I'm not expecting for okra to come up because I planted taters, right? But now if God, by transforming power that he has and nobody else does, if he wanted to make it an okra, he could do it, just like me and you. But we must yield ourselves. The only way it can be is because inside the cuckaburr has been transmitted. So in other words, it had to come from somewhere. When you transmit when you transmit a radio signal, you have to have a base and you have to have a receiver, right? If you don't have a base, the receiver's not going to get it. And if you, if you just have a base with no receiver, nobody's going to get it. So you have to have both. You have to have the foreknowledge and the predetermining, but the foreknowledge first from the base, and then by foreknowledge, I can pick up that this cup, I was a cuckabur. I'm still a cuckabur right. on the outside. But on the inside, there's been a transformation or not a soul transfer. He didn't, he didn't just move the cuckabur over and put the weed in. Right. He took the life right. has been transmitted from a cuckabur wheat. Now, listen to what he says. A cuckabur to a germ called wheat life. 
then you bury that cucumber and it'll produce a grain of wheat. Now, only God can do that. Same way with me and you. Because there has been a life, a life of wheat put in that cucumber. Because there has been a life of wheat put in the cucumber, not just realize you always were wheat. But now look, see where you got to you got to take the other quote though, where Brother Brown said you always were eternal, you always were wheat in the mind of God. When he said let's go back in the back part of God's mind, that is a whole different ball game than being here on the earth. If I may use that word ball game, but it's a whole different thing. Because in the mind of God, we are all eternal. That Genesis 126 man never fell. Never Never fail. You did. But it didn't. So that was always was a germ of wheat. But it was transmitted or transferred on the day that you asked God to save your soul and to receive the new birth, transmitted a life of wheat put in the cuckabur. And the life of the cuckabur has been taken out. What do you mean? That old life you used to live. Right. Same hand, same mouth, all the things you used to do when you were doing sinning in the world, you still got them. Amen? Still got the cuckaber. But it's been washed. It's been sanctified. And the life of the cuckaber has been taken out. But the nature of the cuckaber, I was trying to, we were explaining this Sunday, the nature of the cuckaber is still sticky. Now remember, <clears throat> That's not talking about your soul. Right. Talk about your spirit realm. Yes, right. Memory, reason, conscious, effects, imagination. Because that's my problem now. And my other problem is I don't let that eternal thing that's inside of me do a lot of work. Right. I'm just going to admit it. But see, look, you can wowsy wowsy woo all you want to with this quote. As long as you're in this life, you're going to be stinky. And have a carnal nature. It's going to bother you as long as you live. But inside me, somewhere, I'm born again. No. As long as I'm in this life, I'm sticky. And I got a carnal nature. Now, look, it says carnal nature, not carnal mind. You had a carnal mind when you were in the world. You're supposed to have the mind of Christ when you get the new birth. That's our problem is we're not getting a lot of new births. We're getting anointings. We're getting woo! And not a lot of sitting down and listening to really right. what God is saying to us. Right. But you have a carnal nature because why? You can remember what you used to do. You know where you did it at. You still got the same eyeballs. You still got the same brain, human brain, that tells you, yeah, you used to do that right over there, remember? you? But you know what? But inside of you, you're born again. That part's got to separate somewhere. That's why I said, when you're born again, your soul's in another dimension. It's in you. It's not over there somewhere. Don't get me wrong. But it's, it's contrary to everything that's in this dimension. Everything. Think about it. You're all, the soul that you were, you weren't contrary to the world. You did what they did, right? And you did it willingly. But when God took the willingness out or the willing thing out, you still got memory, reason, conscience, affection, imagination, a carnal nature that's going to bother you as long as you live. But the inside of you, you're born again. And when you're raised up, you're in the likeness of Christ and all the sin is what? Gone from you, that's the thing. Right. Pray and read your Bible. Right. That's the thing. Pray and read your Bible. How are we going to get free from this? Pray and read your Bible, but I want to add one thing. You got to have the correct interpretation of the Bible. You can't just read the Bible because people read the Bible. Listen, there's some sincere people in the world that read the Bible every day. Read, read more than you do. Right. But what do they read it with? Denominational eyes. They read them with three eyes, most of them. 
Trinitarian idea. Hell's eternal. Soul sleeping. You got to remember, every major doctrine come from right here. Good and bad. You got to, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost, though, reject what's bad and take what's good. <clears throat> All right, let's uh, just for a minute. We, knew, we know the first three dimensions of light, time, and matter. We already talked about that. And also Luke 16. We're going to read that in a minute, so just keep going. <clears throat> and I really want you to see, let's go to quote number four. We were talking the other day about sound barrier. <clears throat> This world, or this, when God looked down through time, okay, when God looked down through time, he saw what, what was going to happen, right? That's the foreknowledge. But he knew since the Bible told us they would be ages after the Acts 19. Is everybody with me? Wake up. Acts 19. Or Acts, or Acts, and going to the book of Acts, God knew that he'd have to come back in the Holy Ghost, right? right. Holy Ghost would have to come. That's predestinated. That ain't going to change. Right. But he had a group there that would take it. Right. Yeah. All right, well, now, he, Martin Luther was not in our church age because he knew that part of Martin Luther would have was coming out of the Catholic Church. See, God looked down through history. He saw history. Yeah, right. Listen, to him it wasn't history. Right. Right. It, it was happening. Right. As Dad said Sunday, is this what God thought of, or is this what he's thinking? Right. If it's what he thought of, he's not eternal. Because right. he thought of it back yonder. And it's progressed all the way up. No, this is what he's thinking right now. Right. This is the thoughts of God. Yes. Brother Brown said the thoughts of God are eternal. Right. So they can't change. Right. Now the thought of part is going to go away. Sure. The thought of part, the, the, the sinners, the, the, the false doctrine and all those different things, but look what happened. I want you to understand. This is why I keep reading this. See what happened to us in the end time. God had to come from another dimension right. and break into this dimension. Just like that plane I told you, there were several other pilots. There were several other Luther, Wesley, Pentecost that came right up to what? The plane started shaking. Yeah. We're about 640 miles an hour but I don't think we can take it and they back off. We think speaking in tongues is it, so we'll just take that. We're going to land our plane. Yeah. This is all we got. This is it. Right. Uh, we did it. But no, there was a Chuck Yeager that was there one day. Right. If you read his story, same thing happened. Plane about to fall apart. He said, I had a little about that much stick left or throttle left. He said, all I'd done was pushed. None of the others pushed. Brother Branham gets in the plane, and there's that much throttle left. And all he does is push it. Breaks through the sound barrier, and he said it just smoothed right out. And, man, now they run 1,500 miles an hour. That's almost twice 700 miles an hour. It's 1,400 miles an hour. That is twice past the sound barrier. They just went right on past it. Why? That's me and you. That's the astronaut age. They're running 14,000 miles an hour. They're on another planet right now. God's going to have to clean Mars off now because we've already touched it. Right? Everywhere man's been, Brother Brown said, God's going to have to clean it off. But there's two things that happen when you break a sound barrier. There's a thunder. How many of you have heard it? I mean, you've heard them. Back when I was a kid, they were just breaking, because that was in the 50s, they were breaking the sound barrier. Well, they would come across, and you could hear it. And the plane would be 500 feet ahead of the boom. Yeah. But when they broke that sound barrier, they were going faster than the speed of sound, not light, sound, which is 700 miles an hour. They broke that, and it thundered, and it made a halo cloud. Yeah. That's what happened in this day. When the prophet of God went to Arizona, where do you think that come from? They say, oh, yeah. No, some people say that was from a rocket. I believe that. It was a rocket called Seven Angel. That Brother Brown says in this quote right here, they came from eternity so fast until right. they broke the sound barrier. Right. 
and it thundered. Well, what did it do? It told him what to do. Nobody else heard it, as in all the different times of, of Paul being knocked down on the road to Damascus and Jesus standing in John 17, I think it is, John 12. Father, glorify thy name. There came a voice from heaven saying, I've glorified it and glorified it again. People that stood by heard it, said it thundered. That's the problem. Most people in this message hear the thunder. They see the cloud. But they don't get the voice. There was a mystery behind all that. There was an opening of the word. If we can just break through that static of superstition and things, then the Holy Spirit just begins to fall around like anointing and just blesses the people. You know, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we always... We always use the analogy that if somebody fell over dead right now, you wouldn't have to open the door for their soul to get out. No, it just goes into another dimension. Well, when you received the new birth, it was the soul of God. And it came from a seventh dimension, way faster than anything else. Come right through the wall, wherever you were, down on your knees, crying, praying, people praying for you, and boom, did the work. And you know what? There was emotion. There was some things went on, but they didn't see it enter you, and they didn't see that old you die either. But it happened. It happened. You know why? Because you walk now in newness of life. Listen, if you don't walk in newness of life, I'm telling you one more time, kids to y'all that are 80, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you better find out right now whether you got it or not. Because it's not, it's look. But so many people today are babied, petted. <clears throat> That's one thing our pastor doesn't do, and I thank God for that. I have seen pastors pet people and pet them and pet them, and they stayed babies because you pet babies. Yeah. Brother Dale don't do that. He says, shut up and do your work, do your job. Do what you're supposed to do. Thank God for that. But the fourth dimension, let's look at that just for a second. We know what happens in the fourth dimension. We saw that before. That Just keep go, go, to, go to the number. Yeah, I just skipped that one. I talked about that one. That's the one where he talks about the angels coming from eternity. There you go. <clears throat> now, we have contact through science, the fourth dimension, as it was, because coming right through this building, and I told you that the, it goes by ohms or loops. The, it, it, the lowest one is like three, and it's like three million cycles per second. It cycles three million times, whatever that wave is. Then there's one that's 300 billion times per second that they can go down. And, and man, I mean, how can you talk to somebody in a submarine that's two miles down in the ocean? You got to have something pretty fast. And I tell you, something else is pretty fast. How long, Josh, did it take for them pictures to get from Mars to here? How much? 11 minutes. And that's traveling at the speed of light. Do you know that the sun comes up about seven seconds before you see it? Eight minutes? Eight minutes. The sun's come up, and it takes eight minutes to travel that length, even at 125,000. That's what speed of light is, 125,000 miles per second. Per second. So there is travel. There is something that's got to be done. That's what I'm telling you. Same way with this. Those angels had to travel to come into this dimension to talk to Brother Branham. Then those angels in Jeffersonville. Remember what Brother Branham said? He said, you know, when the angel met him in the cave, he said he just walked into that light. Well, where did he come from? He's in the cave by himself. That angel had to slow down out of that whatever dimension he was in, seventh dimension. He had to slow down to step in that light where he could talk to Brother Branham. Because that was real, folks. That wasn't a spook. That was real business. But you and I have to have this sixth sense to contact what comes through the fourth dimension and not this junk. Coming right through this building now, pictures, voice radio, pictures on television, that our senses does not contact. But see, I believe that's that you got one, two, and three. You got four, which is has no... It's, no, it's not solid. One, two, and three is pretty, we're solid. We're right here. We can't go nowhere. But now in the fourth dimension, there's no, there's no limitation. 
Same way with light. It t may take a little while for it to get to Mars, that signal, but that signal comes from here, travels to Mars, picks up the camera images, and brings them back to Earth. That's pretty real. Yeah. But with God, when he brings you a revelation, you don't have to wait long for it. You don't have to wait long for it. How many times you, were you sitting in a church? I know Boyd was in, in a Methodist church and just, you know, had a Holy Trinity taped on his forehead. But when he heard the truth, that was eternal. That was something that came from another dimension. It didn't come from this one. Your revelation does not come from this dimension. Your revelation comes from that seventh dimension, comes right here to you, and what you get puts you in the fifth or the sixth. Amen? Because what decision you make here, because of what comes to you, and then your travel then, you either got to go to the fifth dimension, which we'll talk about in just a second, the fifth dimension, which is hell, but it's not burning. We saw that before. Let's, let's go on to number 10. Let's skip some of this, and we'll, we'll get done here in just a second. <clears throat> Because remember, we know what the fourth dimension is. We know it's radio waves, and we know it has no plug-in. It's, it's all, it's all Wi-Fi. It's all the different things that you don't have to plug into the wall. It's running through this building. And I'm going to tell you something. When I pray, I pray that God doesn't influence. There are certain people I pray for that I know that's being influenced by something going through that fourth dimension. I just know that. And that's what I pray is Lord protect them. Because listen, without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, why do you, when you were growing up, when, we, when you were in the world, why did you lean to all that? Because that was your influence. That was what was bombarding you all the time. That's why television, they bombarded you with all those images and, and subliminal things that they'd put a Coca-Cola real quick in there, you know, a long time ago when Dad was growing up, they had the Anybody know what a, what a drive through restaurant is? I mean, drive through uh, theater is? Not many do. You used to drive up to the theater, put this thing in your car, and watch the screen. And most of the time, it was like... <laughs> but anyway, but that's what you were influenced by. And then they would have subliminal messages that would be so fast, and it would be a Coca-Cola or a popcorn. Right, Donnie? And, and you wonder, why in the world? Why in the world am I hungry at the minute and I just eat three pizzas, being a kid or a young adult, I just eat three pizzas and drink three Coca-Colas, and now I'm sitting here watching this movie, and five minutes into the movie, I need some popcorn. Why? That subliminal message was on that screen that you didn't see it. It was so fast. You couldn't see it with your natural eye. But what picked it up? Your subconscious picked it up. The spiritual part of you picked it up and it made this thing react to it. Remember, they did away with that because they, they made it illegal because they was making people do all kinds of stuff. And you'd never see it, but once you slow it down, you could see that image of that Coca-Cola or that popcorn with butter all over the popcorn. Anyway, so, but see, that's what, listen, you and I are influenced by that fourth dimension. Even Brother Brown said demons traveled in the fourth dimension. Cancers, all that travel. And where's it going? It's going in here. It's going in here. Yeah. Not so much in your mouth, but it's influencing you, and you don't even know it. That's why with a carnal mind, you can't contact God. Because you've got all that other stuff to contact. But once you get the mind of Christ, what is it? The base has found a receptor or somewhere it can send it to and then he can talk to you. Because listen, that's one thing for sure. The devil does not want you to have a revelation of God. He does not. He fights it. He'll send you everything in the world but that. So that fourth dimension absolutely still influences us even when we're talking on cell phone, when we're doing all the different things. Wi-Fi and all that, it's beating your head. You just don't know that. It's beating your brain, going through your conscious, sub subconscious all the time. All the time. It's influencing you. And look now, man, it's, 
It's just everywhere. There's nothing plugged in anymore. Everything has to go through the airwave. Amen? <clears throat> now, the fifth dimension is where the sinner, the unbeliever, dies and goes to. The fifth dimension is kind of, well, the horrible dimension. Now, this man, when a Christian dies, he goes in the sixth dimension, and God is in the seventh dimension. Now, then we see the Christian, when he dies, he goes under the altar of God, right into the presence of God, under the altar, and he's at rest. To break it down, when a man has a nightmare, he's not altogether asleep, neither is he awake. He's between sleep and awake. And that's what makes him have a horrible shaking and screaming because he's not asleep and he's not awake. And to take that shows where a man goes when he dies unconverted. He's lived his time up. He's dead on earth. And he cannot go into the presence of God because he's not fit to go there without the blood. And he's caught. He can't come back to earth because his time's finished here. And he's caught between and he's in a nightmare. Right. He can't go in the presence of God to rest. And he can't back, come back to earth because his time's up. He's in a nightmare. And there he stays. Think about somebody like, uh, like Cain or somebody that died, I say, un, un, unregenerated. Yeah. He's been falling for years, thousands of years. So let's read this next one. Countdown. Then I think the fifth dimension is where the sinner dies, where he goes. Now I think that when the sinner dies, he goes to this. Now he says fourth dimension. He means fifth. The first thing, he cannot go in the presence of God because he's a sinner. His time's up on earth. If I would type it for you, it's like going to sleep. How many of you have been asleep? The most vivid dream I ever had in my life was I got shot in the head with a gun. My head hurt. When I woke up, just like somebody shot me in the head, but that's how it woke me up, somebody was robbing a convenience store. And I was, the, I was trying to get him out the, out the door of the convenience store to you know, keep the other people. And I said, take me outside. But when he took me outside and saw the police, he, just, I, he pulled the trigger. And when he did, I felt the thing hit me in the head and woke me up. But you know what? I woke up, though. That's been years ago. And I think I'm all right now. But what about if you can't? What if that's a recurring dream that you can't wake up from? What if that's something in your life that, that maybe God came to you during a time of that and says, here, let me help you? And you said, no, I don't want any help. Well, whatever that was is just a recurring nightmare. Because remember, look, the presence of God is hell enough for me. Not having the presence of God, not being able to be, have grace, not being able to know that there's a God that can save me and you being in a place where you can't, that's more hell than anything. You, that, burning up would be a pleasure. But that recurring nightmare, look, hideous things, you're screaming. That's the state of the wicked dead. He can't go in the presence of God because he's a sinner. He cannot return back to earth because his time's up and he's caught between the two things in the fifth dimension. He's got a soul and he cannot go in the presence of God because it's not covered by the blood. He's a sinner. He cannot wake himself up because his time's up on earth. So there he is in a tormented nightmare. Think of that now before you enter it. A nightmare, scream. Many of us have had nightmares. It's just because you're told because the two consciences are passing, sub and first conscious, and it catches between. How many of you had a weird dream, but it's, and you don't even know where in the world that come from? Right, well, that's the two dimensions. Something, something influenced that. You just don't know exactly what it was. And that's the nightmare. When a sinner dies, he's caught with his soul between earth and hell in a nightmare. And there he stands. All right, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> let's read that one. For Christ also had once suffered for sin, the just to the unjust. Now, we know what happened there. He went, when he, when he gave his life at Calvary, his soul didn't stay in the tomb. His soul went down to hell <clears throat> and preached unto the, soul, uh, unto the spirits in prison. Now, remember, I have another quote, but I'm not going to read it, where Brother Brown said, see, they were people. They were souls. He could talk to them. Just like when he goes to paradise and he opens up the door and Abraham says, hey, Sarah, that's the man we fed the calf to. Ezekiel's looking over his shoulder and saying, that's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. All the different ones saw him in their own revelation, but it was a man standing there. Right. It was God in theophany form was standing there Amen. by which he went and preached into the spirits of prison, which sometimes were disobedient 
But once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, thank God for a prophet, Brother Brown said that was all those people that died in the flood. They turned God down. Because see, everybody turned God down but eight people. <clears throat> While the ark was preparing, within, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. All right, keep going. <clears throat> Number 12, souls in prison. Now, Jesus, after he had finished his ministry, preached to those souls that were unsavable. Now, God, by foreknowledge, knew they were unsavable, so he fixed a place for them. But remember, we're going to read here in just a second, and then we'll close. <clears throat> it's not a burning hell. There is no judgment has been passed yet on anybody except the devil and the beast because the Bible's already said that. All right? <clears throat> now, watch. He went and preached to the souls that were in prison that repented not. When mercy was given to them, look, that's what I mean. That moment that they were given mercy, they spurned it. So whatever state they were in, that's the state that they're sitting there in the loop, I believe, in the fifth dimension, knowing and realizing that somebody did something for them and they rejected it. When mercy was given to them, they spurned mercy, and now they're waiting for the judgment. Oh, what a time. That must have been, oh, I wish there's some way I could shake the world with that to let them see the reality, see what the reality is. All right, let's go to 13. But after the days of his preaching, his ministry continued on because the last group he preached to was the souls that were in hell that could not be forgiven. I have clearly read that from the Bible here in 2 Peter. He went and preached to the souls that were in prison, which is hell, locked up until the day of judgment. So they can't move. Because you see, the judgment isn't now. There is no burning hell now. Right. See, thank God for that. Because you know what? Everybody says, well, no, we're in hell burning. No, there's not a burning hell right now. Right. Somebody tells you the guy's in a burning hell. That's wrong. A judge of this earth is just enough to never condemn a man until he's brought to trial. So when we get to the white throne judgment, that's the trial. And God will never throw a man into the fiery furnace until first he is condemned by God's own laws. He rejected mercy, so you see he first has to have a trial, and the trial is the great white throne judgment, but now he's in a place called a prison house. <clears throat> All right, let's read this in Luke, and then we'll finish right here. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and it was, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now remember, we know that's paradise. That's not the sixth dimension, but there was a place there for those Old Testament saints called paradise. It wasn't that Abraham was sitting there and everybody was sitting in his chest, his bosom. It was the faith. Abraham was the father of faith. They died with a what? With a, <clears throat> they had a testimony that they believed what Abraham believed yeah. and desired to be fed with the crumbs. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. Now remember, there's no burning hell, but he's being tormented. Right. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Who? The rich young ruler being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off. Because look, from that paradise to where that rich young ruler was must have not been a complete wall. They must have been be able to see through the dimensions. They were so close. Because remember, look, let me be honest. Paradise was a holding place until Calvary. They couldn't go in the presence of God under bulls and goats. That's why I said they, they, they did, there was no new birth in the Old Testament, so there can't be a sixth dimension that you can put there like Brother Brandon because remember, when Samuel was brought up, Samuel was not a young man. Right. Samuel was the same prophet that Brother Brown said he had his prophet robe and everything still on, and they recognized who he was. Now listen, when Brother Brandon went across the curtain of time, he couldn't recognize a bunch of them people except the ones he saw when he was younger. The 90-year-old woman that got eternal life, he didn't know who she was. He saw her when she was 90 years old. So that place, to, to me, paradise was just a holding place waiting Christ to die on the cross. And then he could empty up that and put him in a dimension. <clears throat> but Lazarus, and he lived hell, in hell, 
the rich young ruler, lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. In other words, they were standing together. All right? <clears throat> and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tor tormented by this flame. Now, I looked that word flame up. It does not mean fire. It means a torment. Not a literal flame because the prophet just told us there is no burning hell right. at the moment. All right? But look that word up. It doesn't always mean fire. It's a torment. <clears throat> but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime... See, you don't lose your senses when you go in these dimensions. Because Abraham is telling that man, Boy, remember what happened? <clears throat> Abraham said, Son... Remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You know, I preached that sermon one time, Why Does the Heathen Rage? I should have read that scripture. Let them rage all they want to. Look what the rich young ruler got, and look what Lazarus got. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. In other words, there's a dimension you can't, we can't pass so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from there or from thence. Look, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, who the, the, the Lazarus, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. In other words, they're still alive. They have a choice. They got to hear what the prophet said. But the rich young ruler didn't have a choice. He done made his choice. And Abraham said, nay, father. Nay, and he said, nay, father Abraham. <clears throat> but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now watch. What did Abraham say? If they hear not Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Because right. Right. why? They made their choice. They're where they're, they're, where they're at, and that's where they're going to have to stay. Right. Is that all right? That's where they're going to have to stay. Now, we'll get to, I want to read this. One more part. They don't have this. Revelation 6, verse 9. <clears throat> I've been studying a little bit on the sixth seal, fifth seal. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. Now, remember, we're over in here now. The fifth seal opens over here. The fifth seal didn't open in the, in the Old Testament. So there's a place of holding for that fifth seal Jew that's not in the sixth and can't be in the fifth. There's got to be somewhere in there, though, but it's a holding place because watch. <clears throat> when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. Now, remember, they can't be under the altar of God because watch what happens. And they cry with a loud voice saying, How long, Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood? That's where Brother Brown got the revelation that that wasn't Christians because Christians would not call for blood. He said that's the fifth sealed Jew that's going to be given eternal life. Avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth. Revelation 6, 11 says, In white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should what? Rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, we know that's 144,000, should be fulfilled. So there's a place of holding for them too. You know why? Because God saw, listen to this, come on musician. God saw he had to blind the Jews. God saw he had to blind the Jews to get me and you. Because the Jews were his first love. The Jews were his first wife. The Jews were the David apple of his eye. But he knew they would do what they were going to do. But he couldn't make them. Listen, come on, Ellie. They could. <laughs> Let's stand to our feet. Ellie's going to come up here and sing a song or something. She's too fast for you, Brother Danny. <laughs> She was coming up here to get Joyce. But you see those people, there's a place of holding because God gave them eternal life because if he hadn't blinded their eyes, you and I wouldn't have come in. He would have took the Jews, they would have been his wife, there would have been nothing else left, and he'd have been just like the Old Testament. He said, destroy every one of them because you're my people. And then I'm going to put you in the promised land. 
right? That's what he would have done. But he knew what they would do. He knew they would fall. He knew they would go horn. But he knew there would be a Rahab. Right. He knew there would be a woman at the well. Right. He knew there would be somebody that would say, be it unto me according to thy word. I'll take the Amen. scraps off of the floor. Amen. Bring me the scraps that the dogs eat. I'll eat them. Right. Call me a dog if you want to, Lord. That's fine. Right. I know who I am. Glory. But I know who you are. Amen. And you're the master. And you own the table, you own the food, and you own me. So she couldn't lose. Let's sing a song. God bless your heart. He that is in me, greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, Satan's like a roaring lion running to and fro. Let's think about these that are not here tonight, the ones that are sick and can't get to church. We know their desire is to be here. We pray that the Lord will give them a blessing tonight. To walk in some sweet hour. Must us today is overcoming power. Oh, greater is he that is in me, and greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Listen now. Oh, on the day of Pentecost, a rushing mighty wind. It fell into the upper room and baptized all of them. Listen now. With a power greater than any earthly foe. Oh, I'm so glad I got in too and I'm gonna let the whole world know. Sing it to him. Oh, greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Oh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He loved the Lord. God knew what we'd need, saw what we'd need, and gave it to us. And put it in plain common language so we can understand it. But he had to send us a prophet to make it more clear. And we thank God for that. But we thank God more for the Holy Ghost because without the Holy Ghost, you'll not understand what the prophet says. Amen? You love the Lord? And I'm going to let the whole world know as you're dismissed. Oh, greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is.